Bulls are now a hard-charging, unyielding group of bull crashers. The University of Connecticut's old Memorial Stadium punctuates its Spartan-like and unadorned roots. Rensselaer Field signifies the fact that they too now walk on college football's red carpet. And on a snowy evening, UConn continuing to honor the memory of their teammate, Jasper Howard. University of South Florida versus UConn, right now. Field. Welcome to Jimmy V Week on ESPN as we continue our commitment to the V Foundation for Cancer Research in tribute to Jimmy Valvano and his dream to defeat cancer. Under the lights here in Connecticut, it's the South Florida Bulls against the Yukon Huskies. I'm Mark Jones along with Bob Davey. And Bob, let's take a look at the headlines. For South Florida, it is all about expectations and managing them. Well, this year, South Florida will be going to their fifth straight bowl game to show you how far this program has come. Their fans, coaches, and players want more, and they now want championships. Mark, it'll be interesting to see how they bounce back from last week's much-anticipated game at home with Miami. UConn, meanwhile, persevering through a very turbulent season. Yeah, Connecticut might be the story of the year in college football in the way they have handled adversity. They have bounced back from five close losses, but Mark, that is secondary to the tragedy this team faced with the death of teammate Jasper Howard. They are going to a bowl game, have a chance to win their seventh game tonight. That's a testimony of this team's character. See a lot of number sixes in the stands here on senior night. 16 seniors being honored, but as for Jasper Howard, the team honoring his memory by leaving his locker exactly as he left it. Many would say that UConn has already won their story of victory of the human spirit. Back with the kick after this. Welcome back, everyone, to East Hartford, Connecticut, under the lights at Rentschler Field, a chilly 34 degrees. The meteorologists were all correct in forecasting a 30% chance of snow because it has been snowing for the last hour and a half. Wintry conditions and a good night for college football. Let's take a look at the standings in the Big East. Cincinnati, by virtue of its thrilling comeback victory against Pittsburgh earlier today, gets the BCS bid. They finish up 7-0 to win the Big East. South Florida at 3-3. Three three. UConn coming in at 2-4. The conference with six bowl-eligible teams. Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Jones along with Bob Davey. Thanks for coming aboard. This is the eighth meeting between these two teams. Bob, when you look at South Florida and UConn, similarities but significant differences, too. Yeah, I mean, they really are opposites, Mark, and this is a classic matchup of a team from the South versus a team from the North, and it's exactly how you think it should be. South Florida, a team from the sunshine, build on speed. Connecticut, a team from this kind of weather we have here tonight, build on power. It's no secret that Randy Edson in Connecticut hope for this kind of weather tonight. It'll be interesting to see how South Florida deals with these conditions. Some of these guys probably have never seen snow before in their life. I think you're right. When we saw them coming out of the hotel a little bit earlier today going through their walkthrough, they made sure that they bundled up very, very well before getting outside. Jim Levitt in his 13th season as head coach of South Florida. He is the only coach that the program has ever known at the FBS level, formerly Division I. And this was the scene a little bit earlier during walkthrough. <laughs> South Florida players uh, literally getting a taste of the snow. I'm not sure how long that novelty is going to last, Bob Davey. They may be fighting for a seat next to that heater in a few moments. Connecticut won the toss, deferring to the second half. South Florida will receive the opening kickoff. And we have the ball that has blown off the tee already. And I thought Jim Levitt made a great point, Mark, when we talked to him about playing in cold weather. He said the reality is if we are ever going to win a Big East championship, we're going to have to go win a game in this kind of weather late in the season. So they may not win the championship this year. They're not. But this may be a great dress rehearsal for them. Plancher and Bogan back deep for the Bulls. And this is Bogan. 
And Bogan out to the 31 yard line as we take a look at the starting lineups for the Bulls. B.J. Daniels is the team's starting quarterback. He's completing 51 percent of his passes on the season. Took over after the third game of the season. He's thrown 12 touchdowns versus nine interceptions. And there's a look at the rest of the offensive starters. Right, the team's me? leading receiver is Carl Mitchell, number two. And B.J. Daniels is the team's leading rusher. First down and 10 from just outside the 30-yard line for the University of South Florida. Right between the tackles, it's Mo Plancher. Let's take a look at tonight's impact players brought to you by Liberty Mutual. Well, quarterback B.J. Daniels is by far the most important player on the field for South Florida. Mark, if he plays well, they play well. He really is talented, but he's just a freshman on the other side. Defensive end, Lindsey Witt. He's a little bit inconsistent, but really talented, really plays well in these kind of games against spread offenses. Daniels with the play fake, keeps it himself. A very prolific runner, got to the edge and didn't quite turn the corner, pushed out of bounds at about the 40-yard line by Taiwan Martin. There's a look at the defensive starters for the Huskies. Talked about Witten on the edge, has 11 and a half sacks on the season. Yeah, this Connecticut defense has really struggled the last three weeks. Gave up 711 yards to Cincinnati, 452 to Notre Dame, and 489 mark last week against Syracuse. So they are really, really struggling defensively. Third and short, and B.J. Daniels keeps it himself to get the first down. And, Bob, uh, you talked about the struggles of the UConn defense recently. They lose one of their top linebackers, Greg Lloyd, who tore his anterior cruciate ligament last week and is out for the rest of the season. He's a key part of what they do defensively. B.J. Daniels, meanwhile, has been the starter since the fourth game of the season, took over and made his debut against Florida State in what can be considered one of the biggest wins in program history. First down and 10 from the 43. It's Plancher on the handoff, and oh, Plancher, the 5'9 senior, gets a couple of yards. Interesting South Florida mark a shotgun spread offense team has been under under center tonight and Kevin McCaskill is the starting center. He is really the backup in the football game. Just interesting that they're they're taking the here they are coming out in the shotgun now. Flanger in the backfield beside BJ Daniels. Second down and eight. A designated quarterback draw and Daniels close to the first down and looks like he got it picked up nine yards for the first down South Florida on the season came out of the gate very well started off five and zero for the third consecutive season but then stumbled when they got into the meat of their schedule losing to Cincinnati Pittsburgh and West Virginia and we mentioned that Miami game last week. That was a huge game, a game much anticipated to get Miami at home in Tampa. South Florida just didn't play well. So this is kind of a bounce back game for them. Certainly is, and they give it to the fullback, the first man through. Actually, that's Mo Plancher gets a nice gain, picks up about seven on the play. And really impressive here. You know, South Florida coming out and really taking a play out of Connecticut's playbook. You know, Connecticut's a rushing football team. And you see South Florida just taking it right at him with Mo Plancher, the tailback. Sets up a second down and two. Plancher in the backfield. They've had six consecutive runs to start this game. Bogan in motion. Plancher gets the call again, and Plancher close to the first down at the 36 yard line brought down by Jesse Joseph looks like he got about three and enough for the first down yeah and this is different for South Florida you know you put it in perspective B.J. Daniels the quarterback is their leading rusher they're normally a football team that's a lot of quarterback runs true spread offense a little more of a power offense right here early in the game
First down and ten. Plancher cuts it back between the tackles. Brought down close to the 30 yard line. Plancher, a guy that is right now, Bob, in the midst of one of his most productive stretches in his career. And he's a guy that's been slowed by injuries. Going back to 2006, he tore his ACL in 07, had lingering effects from that knee ligament injury. Then in 08, hurt his elbow and is just now getting back into form and really productive for South Florida. He's not real fast, but he is a good all round back. About 5'9", 200 pounds. Gets the call again, but this time the Husky defense was waiting on him. Brandon Dillon, the first guy to get there for the Huskies. That'll be a loss of a couple yards on the play. Watch, watch this move by Brandon Dillon, number 52. He's going to make a little outside move right here. Always tough to block movement. That was an excellent stunt by Brandon Daniel. Up the 10th play of this opening drive for the University of South Florida coming up. Third down and eight. They have yet to attempt to pass. Always a controlled pass rush against B.J. Daniels, Mark. They come with a little bit of heat. Daniels eluding the rush and falls down on his own side of midfield at the 47 yard line. A huge loss that time by the Bulls. A loss of 19 on the play. Yeah, Mark, I mean, excellent pressure right off the bat right there by number 56, Mike Cox. Huge negative play. Again, a, a freshman quarterback Sometimes real good, sometimes real bad. Looks like he forgot to bring his snow tires for that one. Lost his footing. Alvarado with the punt. Not one of his better efforts, but he gets a good roll down to the 23-yard line. This game with a real wintry feel to it. Temperatures around 30 degrees, and the guys from Tampa bundling up. They'll be on defense when we come back. Welcome back everyone to East Hartford, Connecticut as the grounds crew continue to clear the sidelines where they can see the yard markers. Been snowing since about six o'clock this evening here. It's now what quarter after eight East Coast time. Zeros on the scoreboard between UConn and USF. And this is Andre Dixon, the senior. Take a look at the lineups for the University of Connecticut Huskies. Zach Frazier is a starting quarterback. He's completing 52% of his passes on the season. Been a turbulent year for him. Was injured in the third game of the season and then sat out the next two. Didn't play in the next three after that and then became the starter right before the Notre Dame game. And his team is on a little bit of a roll right now looking for its third straight win, but they won't get it. If George Selvey has any kind of night as demonstrated by that last play. That's why he's All-American, Bob. Yep, and you can see right off the bat, what you've seen out of Connecticut, these first two plays, you're gonna see all night. They are a running offense, ball control offense, obviously a third and long passing situation here, but it's all about establishing the run for Connecticut. Third down and seven coming up. Pass complete. To Ryan Griffin, the tight end, but hit immediately by number three, Jerome Murphy, short of the first down. He picked up three, and it's three and out for the Huskies offensively. The market Connecticut right here, an advantage early in the game with the wind. You know, there is a pretty good wind right now at the back of the Connecticut punter. There's a look at uh, Desi Cullen, one of the seniors that were honored before the game. 16 seniors playing their final game here at Rentschler Field. And a nice boot by Cullen. It drives Horn all the way back to the 15. And Horns has a wave of blockers ahead of him. Got a key one. And he fumbled it. It's loose and the Bulls recover it. On Connecticut side of midfield at the 47 yard line. 
A 60 yard punt but a 26 yard return and a good one by Horns. Yeah great job of getting to the wall of getting to his punt return wall there. The ball gets stripped out by Marcus Easley right there number 29. Fortunate South Florida Hampton back on that football Patrick Hampton. The penalty against the Bulls. They're going to move the ball back to about the 40 yard line as a result. You look at Jim Levitt. Always the issue in these kind of games with the weather, particularly when you're from South Florida. Do you talk about it a lot and prepare your team for what's coming? Or do you just kind of say that's what it's going to be and you don't talk a lot, a lot about it? Always a tough issue in coaching, but the reality is if it's going to be cold, just get them prepared, have the right kind of undergarments on, <laughs> and go with it. Above well, so far, they've warmed up with their running back so far, Mike Ford. Now on the carry, that's the 11th consecutive time that they've run the football in this game. They have yet to pass. Well, on ESPN's Monday Night Football, Ray Lewis and the Baltimore Ravens head to Lambeau Field to take on Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. Both teams need to win to stay in contention for a wild card berth. Ravens Packers on ESPN's Monday Night Football at 8.30 Eastern time. Coverage begins at 7 Eastern with Monday Night Countdown served by Applebee's. Second and long coming up, 11 to go. Mike Ford still in the backfield. DJ Daniels audibling at the line. Since becoming the starter, they've added bits and pieces to what they allow him to do. And we have a flag on the play. As the Bulls call timeout. Well, he continues to grow and get better game by game, but this is a different type of test for quarterback B.J. Daniels. Back after this. ESPN's College Football Primetime. Brought to you by Sonic. Your team is better. Time to let everyone know. TaterTaunt.com. From Sonic, America's driving. And Timberland Mountain Athletics. If you're not fast, you're food. Look at one of the creameries in the area. And, uh, Bob, I don't care if it's only 31 degrees outside and snowing. It's always a good time for ice cream. <laughs> All right. I don't know if they're selling a lot of that tonight <laughs> in the stadium. But. Hot chocolate? <laughs> 6-12 to go in the first quarter. No score on the board. This is South Florida's second offensive possession of the ball game. They've yet to attempt a pass. Daniels on a quarterback draw. And B.J. Daniels brought down at the 28-yard line. Tackled by Wilson and Lutris. Picked up five on the play in the... South Florida players trying to stay warm on the sidelines. You know, it affects a lot of times, Mark, the people that don't play. You know, when you're playing, you're in the moment. When you're sitting on that bench and don't have much chance of playing, that's when it's really <laughs> cold now. So those guys fighting for space around that heater over there on the sidelines. They're down in seven. And Connecticut running a man onto the field a little bit late, and they're forced to take a timeout. Connecticut, the first timeout. Randy Edsel, the head coach at UConn, telling us earlier that he felt that this year's team was extra special because of the way that they handled the adversity, the result of the tragic death of their teammate, Jasper Howard, the night after the Louisville victory. Back in the middle of October. That plus the way that they got themselves over that and through that and worked within that and began to get themselves bowl eligible. A big win at Notre Dame, considered by many to be maybe the biggest win in the school's history. And this is how they continue to commemorate the fall of their teammate, Jasper Howard, former defensive back, was stabbed the night of the Louisville game. On campus at a party. Third down and seven coming up. 
Daniels. And he throws it away. Incomplete at the 35 yard line. Good heat up front. No pun intended. <laughs> Lawrence Wilson and Kendall Reyes. Yeah, immediately Kendall Reyes, a real good defensive tackle, beat the center. Kevin McCaskill flushed B.J. Daniels out of the pocket. This is a good defensive line for Connecticut. Two good defensive ends, both inside defensive tackles are strong. Fourth down and seven. Alvarado into punt, his second one of the game. I'll tell you, Alvarado is not used to the cold weather. You think? Those first two punts, it may be his first experience in cold weather, Mark, because <laughs> he is struggling right now. 32-yard punt, and when we come back, we'll update you on some recent developments in the Jasper Howard case. Welcome back, everyone, to East Hartford, Connecticut, Rentschler Field, Connecticut and South Florida. Zeros on the board with 5-10 to go in the first quarter. Just updating you on the situation with the death of Jasper Howard. There were two additional arrests made recently, but yet no, nothing has gone to trial. The case has not gone to trial, and there have yet to be any convictions either in that case. Jasper Howard, uh, a real leader amongst the Huskies. First down and 10. Huskies starting off with good field position. Play fake. And Frazier has a man wide open. Caught down at the 11-yard line by Marcus Easley. UConn has really become a good play-action team. Play action on first and 10. Zach Frazier hits Marcus Easley, who beats George Baker. Anytime you can run the football, Mark, it sets up play action. And this Marcus Easley is a great story. Came to Connecticut as a walk-on. Arguably the most improved player on that roster this year. First and 10 from the 11. A 44-yard gain on the last play. This is Dixon. Touchdown, Huskies. Andre Dixon had three touchdowns last week against Syracuse and still on a roll. And Mark Big Mike Hicks at 6'6", 325, number 79. Watch him pulling out here. Just engulfs Jerome Murphy. Would you call that a pancake bomb? That's Tell pretty you, close, huh? This is a <laughs> big, big Connecticut offensive line, but set up by the play-action pass. Zach Frazier and they muffed the snap on the extra point and Cullen couldn't get a handle on it Cullen is the punter and didn't get a good snap from center yeah Mark we talked about the guys that don't play that's who the weather affects that deep snapper Derek Chard sitting over there on the sidelines just now came in the game that was a poor snap Bob we saw how that adversely affected Pitt earlier tonight when they lost their game against Cincinnati, that extra point attempt late in the game ended up being the final margin of victory. Yeah, Marcus, take a look at the snap again. He just pulled it. And then Cullen tried to make something happen off it. But, yeah, that's an excellent point. I mean, that probably cost Pitt that football game today, something you take for granted. Well, this was the same pregame, Bob. Not much different from what we just saw a moment ago. That ball a little bit slippery in these kind of conditions and the, can't imagine that your hands are too supple with the cold weather down in the field either. That's exactly right. Nonetheless, six to nothing for the Huskies. Andre Dixon with his 12th rushing touchdown this season, the 15th of his career. He's one of 16 UConn seniors playing their final home game here at Rentschler Field. And boy, Dixon's been a pretty good story when you go back to a young man that his head coach, Randy Edsel, says he couldn't be more proud of anyone on the roster than him, how far he's come. The ball bounces into the end zone by Bogan. And it'll come back out to the 20-yard line, first and 10 for the Bulls. Well, here's what's happening now. It's a... Uh, 
chilly 34 degrees here in East Hartford, Connecticut. And coming up ahead, the Bulls and Huskies contrasting styles playing out right now, as we can see. And later, in Davy Jones' locker, staying the course. First down and 10. Plancher the lone back for South Florida. B.J. Daniels attempting his second pass. It's complete. His first completion. Good for a first down beyond the 30. Evan Landy making the catch, working against Robert McClain. Yeah, Mark, again, play action on first and 10. B.J. Daniels come out. Evan Landy off the play action. Good tackle right there, Robert McClain. But again, everybody anticipates run on first and 10. Connecticut threw the play action last series. B.J. Daniels, South Florida, throws it this series. Pulls the trigger again. This pass complete to Carlton Mitchell, the team's leading receiver. Picked up about seven yards that time. Yeah, this South Florida offense this year, Mark, they've been really good at times and really bad at times. And that's because they have a freshman quarterback. Now, this guy is talented. He is explosive. But anytime you go with a freshman, particularly in this offense, when so much rides on the quarterback, you can be a little bit inconsistent. This time they hand it off. Daniels, the freshman, hands it off to Mike Ford, who was brought down immediately by Kendall Reyes. You know, B.J. Daniels became the starter in the third game of the season when Matt Grophy, who's conspicuous by his absence, was injured. And they're trying to get him back to the point where he was playing like he did against Louisville, where he's confident and really knows what he's doing in tune with the rest of the offense. Well, a young guy from Tallahassee, Florida State won him as a corner. He goes to South Florida, and what a great homecoming this year. Came back home as a freshman at 341 total yards in that South Florida win in Tallahassee. Third down and six. And a flag on the play. B.J. Daniels, Bob, a pretty good all-around athlete, a basketball player for Stan Heath on the Bulls basketball team. Offside, 99 defense, five-yard penalty, third down. That's against Kendall Reyes. You talk about Matt Grothy. He was the face of this South Florida football program. And losing like a, a guy like that is devastating. Now, what you picked up, you picked up a playmaker. And you're getting a lot of experience for the quarterback of the future, but you lost a lot of consistency when Matt Grothy goes down. Third down and short. One to go for the Bulls. Ford in the backfield. Boy, I'm not sure that he got the first down. It's going to be close, depending on this spot. Mike Ford, the 6'2", 222-pound junior. He's the power back. And he got the first down. Yeah, you mentioned Mike Ford at 225 pounds. Runs it up in there on the power play. Yeah, Mark. That was an impressive run right there. They've got a good one-two combination with Mo Plancher, about 5'9", 200, and then Mike Ford at about 6'2", 225. Yeah, Ford was the team's leading rusher a season ago. First down and 10 for the University of South Florida. Ford again with nowhere to go, running into the boundary. And brought down at about the 33-yard line by Jesse Joseph. Joseph, number 91, right there from Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Yeah, you talk about a freshman from Montreal, Canada, coming in here and starting a defensive end. Now, I want you to watch this play right here. Excuse me, he's the next guy out. He's out here on the edge even wider. But that's an excellent play by Jesse Joseph. You see him right there, 91, come into your screen. A little more, bit more attuned to the nuances of uh, American football than most coming from Canada. Second and 17. It's going to be Ford again. Boy, nice run by Ford to stay on his feet into Yukon territory at about the 48-yard line. Yeah, Mike Ford. 
a young guy from Sarasota, Florida. Looks like he's played on this snow before. Yeah. I mean, that was some fancy footwork right there, staying alive. They're going to mark it back at midfield. And it sets up about a third down and one for the Bulls. You know, Mark, this weather looks a little bit worse than it really is. With tell tell that to them around. down in the field. Tell me it's not that <laughs> bad. It's only 33 degrees. <laughs> Third down and one. It's Ford again. Ford's going to get the first down and then some. Well, Bob, I'm going to come clean on this. I mean, it's easy for us to say that, you know, it's chilly down there, but... We're, we're inside. I mean, look at that. That well, looks like we're encased. We're what you, we are. I'll tell you what happens with this, though. Is you're UConn, uh -huh. and you hope all week that the weather's bad, and you think that's going to be your crutch going into this game. All of a sudden, South Florida's not paying attention to that. Right. So you can overdo it as coaches and players for Connecticut thinking you have such a big advantage. I mean, South Florida's come out here right now. It's been no factor early in this football game, the yeah. weather. Coach Levitt said that he didn't even mention it to his team because – Everybody else was, including us in the media, inquiring about how they would handle the frigid conditions. Right now, they trail six to nothing after the first 15 minutes of play. It's B.J. Daniels' move when we come back. Welcome back to Jimmy V Week as the South Florida Bulls take on the Connecticut Huskies from Rentschler Field. I'm Mark Jones, along with Bob Davey and folks, to donate to the V Foundation for Cancer Research. Call 1 800 4 Jimmy V. Or log on to www.jimmyv.org. 100% of the every donation award to cancer research. Mark, that's Evan Landy right there, the backup quarterback in the game at wide receiver. Caught that pass a little bit earlier. Always getting nervous as a defensive coach when that backup quarterback's out there at a different position. B.J. Daniels completes the pass at the 40-yard line, and there he is again, Bob. As you mentioned, Evan Landy, the redshirt freshman, working against Robert McClain. Yeah, another freshman out of Coral Springs, Florida. And, you know, you talk about the differences in these programs, although they're both pretty new on the scene in the FBS. South Florida, just so many players, Mark, in that area of the country. You know they have the lowest recruiting budget in the country in football, they don't have to go very far now. They do. They have the lowest recruiting budget in the country. They spend less money than anyone because those players are just so close down in that South Florida area. On second and five, it's going to be Ford straight ahead. And that's why, Bob, when you talk about them losing to Miami last week and them defeating Florida State earlier this season, that impacts their recruiting, doesn't it? No question, Mark. I mean, it's the big three. They're trying to break into that big three. They're right on the verge. But I'll give you a stat. They spent $468,000 on recruiting. Tennessee spent $2 million last year. West Virginia and the Big East spent over a million. So they're doing it at $468,000. It just shows you all you have to do is jump in that car. <laughs> you don't have to do much flying when you're coaching in Tampa, Florida to find college football players. Head down 95 at the turnpike. Third down and two. B.J. Daniels from Tallahassee, Florida, makes a move. He's going to be stopped up short of the first down at the 38-yard line. It'll be fourth down coming up for the Bulls. Yeah, great effort by Lawrence Wilson, the linebacker, their number one tackler, a guy from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Paul Bryan High School. First player ever at UConn from Alabama making that play. And they're going to punt it now, South Florida will. Uh, Delbert Alvarado, this time I think with the wind at his back. McLean back deep. Alvarado aiming for the corner. And it goes into the end zone. It'll come back out to the 20-yard line on the 38-yard punt. Well, South Florida and UConn, relative newcomers to the FBS, and both teams making their impact very quickly on the polls. Connecticut, the second fastest to get their national ranking. South Florida took six years and three weeks. So, you know, in the big picture, both doing very well. That's unbelievable. It really is. And you see how far this Connecticut program has come with facilities. 
their on-campus facilities now are as nice as anybody's in the country. Both these programs, amazing stories. First down and 10, this is Andre Dixon. And Dixon stopped up at the line of scrimmage. Let's take a look at tonight's impact players brought to you by Liberty Mutual. Well, obviously, Connecticut is going to line up and run the football tonight. They have two really good backs in Andre Dixon, and Jordan Todman has come on the scene as of late. The sophomores had a great season. Two defensive ends from South Florida, outstanding. I mean, George Selby, every run, everyone around the country knows his name. Jason Pierre Paul, a junior college transfer, may be as talented or more talented than George Selby. This is Jordan Todman, the guy you were alluding to a few moments ago, picking up five. He's the team's leading rusher. Had 123 yards rushing and a touchdown last week in that route of Syracuse. Really playing with a lot of confidence right now. And, I'm sorry, Mark, a signature of both of these teams, players that weren't necessarily highly, highly recruited, but developed. I mean, this is a young running back out of North Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Really only Purdue and Connecticut were his two offers. So both these programs, great job of developing guys who were under the radar a little bit. Fraser's going to take off. Makes it out to the 28-yard line, so that's short of the first down. Fourth down coming up. Robinson in on the stop for the Bulls. Yeah. The cut five. Couldn't help but think of Mark Sanchez. Oh, not sliding? Yeah, not sliding in all the conversation that's received this week yeah. in the New York area. <laughs> they don't, they don't have a sliding coach to come slide? in, right? Tonight's an easy night to slide. Yeah. Zach Frazier's been banged up a little bit this year. Remember, he missed the middle part of the season, missed some five games after getting injured in the second game of the season. Cullen's punt will take a Connecticut roll all the way down inside the 35 yard line well with the weather and the field conditions this could boil down to special teams kicking and field position boy you'd think on a Saturday night that Santa Claus was loading up the sled getting ready to make some deliveries in a few weeks instead he's taken in a little Yukon football 10 39 to go six nothing Connecticut leading South Florida talking of and speaking of early presence, Cincinnati getting one today, defeating Pittsburgh to win the Big East. Bob, what about that Gatorade shower? You only got the bottle. <laughs> what? Are they downsizing? Is it the economy? I mean, man, that may be a signal he's leaving. <laughs> Maybe he's going to Notre Dame. They didn't want to do the whole deal, you know. Huh? <laughs> Save the rest of the Gatorade for the next. Exactly. Coach? Exactly. <laughs> now that's a great, great win. For Cincinnati, huh? Bouncing back in that game today. Marty Gilliard with so many big plays. This is no planted. And there's a fumble. Ball is loose. And Connecticut has it. Tell you, Lawrence Wilson, Mark, stayed with it. Eventually punched that football out of there. Let's take a look. Plancher on the power play. Kind of bulldogs Wilson. Stays with it. I mean, really didn't punch it out. Mo Plancher just kind of gave it up right there. And Lutris recovering it. And Mark, those are the things. You can talk about the cold weather and all those things in preparation. There's no way South Florida can practice the conditions that Mo Plancher just had right there carrying that football. First down and 10 coming back the other way from the 42 yard line of the Bulls. This is Todman running into the boundary. He's pushed out of bounds just shy of the 40. Williams making the stop for the Bulls. Another I formation team. Watch the fullback, Anthony Sherman, on this block right here. He's going to line up in the backfield. You're going to see him come out on the perimeter. Whack. Interesting today, Pittsburgh and UConn so similar in their offenses. Both kind of the old dinosaurs, as Dave Wanstead calls them, playing with the fullback. Little play fake. And a dart complete to Marcus Easley, his second catch of the night. And another first down for the Huskies, a pickup of 13. A lot of people around the country, you talk about Northeast teams. This is what Northeast is built on. 6'6", 325, 6'5", 325, 6'7", 317. 330-pound right guard. Reminds me of those old Boston College teams. That's what UConn is becoming, Mark. 
of the most proficient running teams in the nation. And we're going to send it back down Interstate 84 to Wendy Nix. What's up, Wendy? Thank you very much. More of the same. The inclement weather here as well. It's a Taco Bell studio update. Jonathan Dwyer from four yards out. This is the ACC championship game, and George Tech is on top, Mark 10 to 7. Back to you. All right, Wendy, second down and 11 coming up here. Georgia Tech trying to bounce back off that disappointment last week, losing to their cross state rivals from Athens. Fraser working out of the shotgun. Completes it to Todman. Todman keeping his feet underneath him and making it down inside the 25 yard line. Picked up four on the play. Zach Frazier. Interesting story, Mark. Goes to Notre Dame. After spring practice, Charlie Weiss tells him, you're our fourth quarterback. I don't see you moving up much, if at all. Decides to transfer, ends up here at uh, Connecticut. Young guy out of Pennsylvania. You ever been to Mechanicsburg? I have been to Mechanicsburg. Okay. His problem early in the year, just trying to force it too much. This time he hands it off to Dixon, who comes into the ball game. But, Bob, they talked about him really turning for the better in the second half of that Rutgers game and then the Notre Dame game kind of a payback thing for him he played well yeah Mark and they talk about him forcing the ball early wanting it too much but you can understand why here's a guy highly highly recruited goes to Notre Dame really kind of leaves with some embarrassing public comments when you're told you're the fourth quarterback and I doubt you're going to move up transfer sit out a year you know how much he has invested so you know how badly he wants it. So it kind of makes sense that early this season he was forcing things, trying to make too many things happen. Bob, interesting. They're going for it here on fourth down and seven. Fraser open, caught. Moore. And Moore all the way down to the seven-yard line, but there's a flag down on the play on the 17-yard pickup. Let's see if it stands. Zach Hurd, that big right guard at 6'7", 315. Sets up fourth and 17 now, and uh, the punting team coming onto the field for Randy Edsel. Yeah, that was a huge penalty. You know, Connecticut comes into the game number three in least amount of penalties in the country. South Florida at 99, so a big advantage for Connecticut coming into this football game as far as least penalties, but that one was costly. Cullen tries to hang it up inside the 10. And it bounces into the end zone. 7.06 to go in the first half on the 34-yard punt. The Bulls still looking to get on the scoreboard when we come back. ESPN's College Football Primetime. Brought to you by... Bud Light, with the just right taste that's not too heavy, not too light. The difference is drinkability. Look inside at the wonderful, comprehensive facilities athletically here at UConn. Bob, you mentioned it earlier that uh, they can compete with anyone when it comes to facilities. Yeah, and you have to realize where they've come from because they virtually had no facilities several years ago. So, I mean, they have come so far. Jones along with Bob Davey in the snow first down and 10 for USF a gaping hole for Ford who runs it right up the middle nice gain of about seven yards on the play under seven minutes to go Robert Vaughn making the stop just back to Connecticut you know they've been playing football since 1897 they were in one double a football until seven years ago but you know they have a heck of a history Mark, you brought up the point you were talking to one of their former players that played when they were 1AA. Yeah. He's a little upset <laughs> that people talk about UConn's only played football for seven years. That makes sense. Yeah. He had a deeper sense of the program's history than most people. Second and three. Daniels runs for the first down out to the 35-yard line, and you go back to how things used to look here in Stores, Connecticut for the football program when they were 1AA or FCS Memorial Stadium. 
is where they used to play between 1953 and 2003. And uh, that former player I spoke with in the hotel lobby speaks fondly of those days. But Bob, he also said, I wish I'd played right now, too. Yeah, you've got that right, Mark. <laughs> I mean, this place has come a long way. And this is a beautiful facility here at Rentschler. Holding penalty that time on Bogan, number 81, the wide receiver. And, you know, in these kind of games, field position is so, so critical. South Florida has yet to score last week in that loss against Miami, 31 to 10, only 10 points. So right now in a little bit of an offensive drought. And the question still begs, how did they bounce back from that loss against Miami, a game in which they had, had hoped to do so well? High expectations going into that one. Ford again on the counter. Boy, some big hits down in the field. And Ford goes down after a gain of about four. Well, join Reese, Mark May, Lou Holtz, and Jesse Palmer Sunday night for the bowl selection special. The matchups of all 34 bowl games will be announced and dissected by the analysts. The bowl selection special powered by Chevrolet Silverado on ESPN Sunday at 8 Eastern. For more information, log on to ESPN.com. Third and seven coming up. And I swear this year I'm going to win the bowl challenge amongst the announcers. Pass complete to the 32 yard line. Jesse Hester making the catch and a first down for the Bulls, a gain of nine. Really a good, quick decision by B.J. Daniels. South Florida in the empty set just raised up and hit Jesse Hester for a quick first down. Here's what's happening now. You saw that. Total yardage about even ahead and one icon remaining. Daniels pulls it down. Wide open on the sidelines, complete. At the 42 yard line, Kelly makes the grab. Yeah, they call him the magician. I'm talking about BJ Daniels. You're going to see him right here, why he has that nickname. He makes Lindsey Witten, number nine, miss. And Lindsey Witten is their best pass rusher. Watch right here. Then he comes out of there, and as you know, Mark, it's impossible to stay in coverage when the quarterback scrambles. But that was a great effort right there, getting away from Lindsey Witten. Daniel's a pretty poised young man, a 27 yard gain on the play. Talked about him making his debut in his hometown of Tallahassee, Florida, several weeks ago. They're going to review that last play, but to go in front of a hostile crowd of over 80,000 at Dope Campbell Stadium and win tells you a lot about Daniel's ability. Yeah, let's take a look and see what they're reviewing right here. I'm not sure Kelly knew exactly where he was. I don't, I don't know if he knew he was that close to the sideline. I'm not sure I know exactly where he was looking over there with that snow on that sideline. Remember, there must be indisputable video evidence to overturn the call on the field. You see the ruling on the field right there? Pass complete. I'll tell you, these uh, snow games always make things a little bit interesting. Forty to go in the first half. Let's take a look again over there on that far sideline. After further review, the play stands. First down, South Florida. Good, quick decision right there by the Big East crew. Fifty-three seconds in all. Some big reviews today in the Pittsburgh-Cincinnati game. Yes. Jonathan Baldwin. Uh, with the catch for a touchdown with one foot in. Say what you want about instant replay, Mark. I am a big, big fan of it. Ford in the backfield, first down and 10. Ford on the carry straight ahead and stopped up, stoned at the 40 yard line. Gain of one on the play. UConn's defense, which has struggled for most of the year, 
pretty stout so far. But. Yeah, you're right. I mean, they came into this game ranked 75th in the country, but really have given up a lot of yards the last three weeks. Playing well tonight. Getting the turnover right here. Lawrence Wilson on Mo Plancher. Second down and nine for the Bulls. Daniels going up top, has a man downfield, and overshoots his receiver, number 81, Dontavia Bogan. Looked like Bogan slowed down when the ball was in the air. Yeah, Mark, it did. Bogan behind the freshman corner, Dwayne Gratz. Tell you what, that football up in the air with all that snow. Pretty good head for a slide, too. Daniels, five of seven for 58 yards. Third down and long coming up. You know, they're 102nd in sacks allowed. This is a football team that's given up a lot of sacks, Mark. And the play clock expiring. But they called a timeout before it did. <laughs> Referee dealing with that cold weather. <laughs> it's kind of locking up a little bit. <laughs> Those lips aren't as supple either in the cold, huh? Back after this. South Florida Bulls getting a taste of a white Christmas light type night. They trail 6 0 with 340 to go in the first half. I'm Mark Jones along with Bob Davey, and this is Dr. Pepper. Championship weekend. Boy, what a surprise in that Florida Alabama game. The way that Alabama really dominated them, Bob. Boy, they did. From the first snap of the game. And how about everything riding on that Texas Nebraska game tonight? If you're the BCS proponents, you have to be hoping that Texas wins that game and everything's clean. Yeah. And it's Texas and Alabama in the national championship. If Texas stumbles, then that opens the door for Cincinnati out of the Big East. On the little receiver screen, number 81, Bogan with the catch and the first down at the 23 yard line. Let's check in with Wendy in the studio. Mark, thank you. And we check in on the Big 12 championship game. Take a look at this. Texas set to punt. It does not go so well. Eric Martin gets a hand on it. Nebraska recovers. So Zach Lee making every effort to take advantage of the opportunity. The very next play. Keep an eye on Lee. Throws. Going deep to the end zone. Going, going. Picked off by Aaron Williams. It remains 6 0 Nebraska over Texas. All right, Wendy. After that 17 yard gain, it's first down and 10 for the University of South Florida. And really, Colt McCoy in that game? Probably a chance to lock the Heisman down. But right now, the Longhorns getting shut out. Logan in motion to the top of the screen. They give it to Ford. Got to the corner. A nice gain for close to another first down at the 13-yard line. Pickup of about 10 on the play. Mention the high. So you think Colt McCoy is the front leader going into the final Boy, weekend here? Just he's so hot late in the season. And that game last Thanksgiving night against Texas A&M, so many people watching that game. I mean, Ingram's in it because he's playing for the potential national championship team. They're undefeated. I don't see any way Gerhardt, with the losses they've had, Stanford, they've had a great season. Do you keep Tebow in it after today's loss? Uh, just on body of work. I mean, you bring him to New York, but I think it's Colt McCoy's. But right now, kind of like if Texas loses that game and Colt McCoy doesn't play well, it's wow. all wide open. Under three Marty minutes, so. Gilliard from <laughs> Cincinnati comes into that. Talk about some huge <laughs> plays on kickoff returns. Second and one. Landy in motion. Daniels hands it off to Ford. And a gaping hole. Ford. Touchdown, Bulls. Mark on a night like this. A slow track. You go to that big power back Mike Ford. That's why you don't see Mo Plancher in there as much. But this big 225 back, pound back in the snow, has Randy Edsel concerned. You got to like the footwork of this guy, Mark. 
And they really went untouched, yeah. though, right there to the end zone. But those big power backs in this kind of weather. Speaking of the weather, Bob, let's keep an eye on the extra point and the snap and the placement, which was tricky and failed for UConn earlier. Landy, the backup quarterback, places it down, and the extra point is up and good. The animated head coach, <laughs> Tim Levitt, amped up in the snow. We'll be back. Mike Ford capping a nine-play, 80-yard drive, using up 433 on the clock with a 14-yard touchdown run a few moments ago, and the Bulls lead the Huskies 7-6. With 2.33 to go here in the first half of play at Rentschler Field. I'm Mark Jones along with Bob Davey of South Florida. Looking to bounce back from losing last week against their cross-state rivals from down south in Miami. And Jim Levitt, their head coach, always animated, always filled with a lot of yeah. energy. It doesn't matter how many layers he has on. <laughs> He's still going to be animated. I saw him early this morning. He was just getting back from a park. He found a park in downtown Hartford somewhere, got a little exercise. His motor was running early this morning. Nonstop. I know one thing, born and raised in St. Petersburg, this probably legitimizes in his mind why he stayed <laughs> at South Florida a night like this. They bounce the kickoff, and UConn fields it cleanly and they're going to get good starting field position here right around midfield at about the 48-yard line. Well, on ESPN's Monday Night Football, Ray Lewis and the Baltimore Ravens head to Lambeau Field to take on Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. Both teams need a win to stay in contention for a wild card berth. It all starts 8.30 Eastern time. Coverage begins with Monday Night Countdown served by Applebee's at 7. First down and 10 for UConn. UConn has been very proficient in kickoff returns this year they've run back three for touchdowns and even though South Florida tried to kick that one and squib it short still good field position here for Zach Frazier. Frazier downfield and dropped almost intercepted there by Webster. Let's go back to Wendy. Thank you very much. Coming up on the Outback Steakhouse Halftime Report, the Crimson Tide roll on. Cincinnati makes a statement with a win over Pittsburgh, plus updates from the ACC and Big 12 championship games. As always, I'm joined by Robert and Todd. We'll see you at the half. All right, Wendy, second down kind of up here. Ten to go for the Huskies. That was Frazier's first miss of the night. He's now four of five. Hands it off this time to Dixon. Dixon stopped up at about the 49-yard line. Check that Jordan Todman picked up two. Todman and Dixon, great runners this year. Good productivity. Todman's already gone over 1,000 yards of the season. Dixon was approaching that mark coming in. Yeah, and they've rushed for over 200 yards as a team the last three weeks. Bob, for them to be able to replace Donald Brown, who led the nation in rushing last year, and really not skip a beat, says a lot about the coaching. It really does. You know, Donald Brown, a first-round pick of the Indianapolis Colts. Frazier throws a laser complete. Easily. Still on his feet. And down to the 33-yard line, first down. And it's interesting. You know, I talked to Mike Enright, UConn's SID. He said he's never seen a player come as far as Marcus Easley. He said when Marcus Easley used to come into the game, Mark, everybody knew it was going to be run. When he was in a wide receiver, he was literally in there to block. But came to UConn just as a regular student, walked onto the football team, and has really come on. Only had four catches all last year. His pass complete again over the middle. That's easily again, and Bob, he may have played himself this year. Some people feel into a, a, a middle-round draft pick even. Well, you look at it. In 07, he had one catch. In 08, he had four catches. This year, he has 38 catches. And this was a guy that they said no way did they think he would ever reach this level as a wide receiver at UConn. Since the Pittsburgh game really emerged as a leader. 
Pass tipped and incomplete at the 15 yard line. Almost intercepted by Murphy. Yeah, you better take a little bit of heat off and help out those receivers, particularly on a night like this. Brad Cunyu couldn't squeeze it. 41 seconds to go in the first half. Ball at the 22 yard line. Todman the lone back, three receivers in on the play. Fraser up top, wide open, touchdown! Easily. His fifth catch of the night, and this one good for six. It all starts with pass protection. What's the right offensive tackle, Hicks? That is a great job right there against Jason Pierre Paul. And Marcus Easley continues to have a great night. That's what senior night's all about, Mark. The Marcus Easleys of the world that have come so far in college football. 16 seniors playing their final home game here at Rentschler. And they blow this one dead prior to the snap. And Coach Edsel's got the watch on the snap and the placement and the kicker. Offside, 98 defense. Half the distance to the goal. Replay the down. What's he doing with that watch, That's Bob? what head coaches do. <laughs> <laughs> they love the time of those kickers. You know, you have the special teams coach coaching his rear end off on field goal protection, punt protection. Got the head coach standing back over that watch. What, what, what kind of number are we looking at on that thing on the snap and the kick <laughs> and everything? Is it a 1.7? Is it? They love to break it down, like you said. 35 seconds to go here in the yeah, first Those half. hands are cold now. You're tempted to go for two right here if you're UK. A tough snap and a good job by Cullen to get it down placed. Knock it through and it's now 13 to 7 with 35 seconds to go. That's the guy that they affectionately call easy. Yeah, but the big guys, Mark, this is a night for the big guys under these conditions. And that's what I like about this offensive line for Connecticut. I mean, these big old offensive tackles. I'm impressed with my kicks because South Florida's defensive ends, Selvi and Pierre Paul, are really good pass rushers. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, we haven't said Selvi or Pierre Paul's names that frequently so far in the first half. And between the two of them, a lot of career sacks. But the big fellas keeping their quarterback Zach Frazier upright yeah. so far. You don't see any long sleeve shirts on under those guys. They just trying to be macho. You just can't wear them. <laughs> I mean, it's just something you just can't do. Even though you probably want to, uh -huh. you just can't do it. Particularly with South Florida on the other sidelines. You're trying to send out a signal that it's colder for you than it is for us. It's interesting. Uh, one of the interesting numbers coming into this game for the Bulls was that as you look at them on the sidelines, yeah. staying warm. They are one and two in games played in cold weather where the temperature kickoff was 40 degrees or below. And, you know, they like to tell people, hey, we went up to West Virginia last year and it was about 20 degrees and we played well, albeit they lost that game. So they went in with the mindset that the snow and the wind and the cold wasn't going to be a factor here tonight. Bounces off one of the bull players up near the 50 yard line and it's a loose ball. South Florida recovering the fumble. Let's take a look at how these two quarterbacks have played. Freshman B.J. Daniels, you know, both of them high, high completion rating. Both quarterbacks played well. You know, with B.J. Daniels, it all comes down to rushing yards, too, because he's their leading rusher. But both quarterbacks under the conditions playing pretty well throwing the football. Well, for B.J. Daniels, a little bit of a turning point for him was after that loss against Pitt, he took it really hard, was crestfallen, so he decided to disable his Facebook page, Bob, and change his cell phone number, came back and got the win against West Virginia. How many stories have we heard this year of guys unplugging those Facebook pages? <laughs> 
I guess they're good things if you play well and win. Yeah. They're really bad things if you don't play well and lose. Yeah. It's the new age. Social media. And B.J. Daniels, not too sociable for UConn here, refusing to go down and all the way down to the Husky 40-yard line with oh. 21 seconds to go. He ran over Harris Agbor, the strong safety number 27 out there in the open field, Mark. Still time to get something done here, perhaps getting in field goal range. They spike it, stopping the clock. Yeah, boom, right there. You know, this guy was a point guard. Actually had a scholarship offer. Memphis was talking about football and basketball. He is really a good athlete. You know, interesting, Rich Rodriguez, when he was at West Virginia, recruited him as a wide receiver. Then Rich goes to Michigan and says, you know what, I want you as a quarterback. We need a quarterback up here. He said, no. Nah. <laughs> you wanted me as a wide receiver what earlier. <laughs> what changed? Ended up going to South Florida, who had recruited him all along. Second and ten for Daniels. Pass complete at the 28-yard line to Carlton Mitchell, the team's leading receiver, picking up 12 on the play. South Florida with one timeout remaining. Ten seconds to go. Eric Schwartz is their place kicker. Yeah. And now they burn their final timeout of the half. That was a good Actually job. Spiked yeah. It. yeah, of saving that timeout. These are always interesting situations, Mark. You're at eight seconds. Obviously, he cannot scramble around, which would be his first instinct. I'm talking about B.J. Daniels. You can't scramble around and use up that eight seconds. There's certainly time for one play you because see. you do have the timeout. Well, you see the timeouts at the bottom of your screen. South Florida with one remaining and UConn with two. Schwartz there with a career long of 50. So with the ball at the 29 right now. And this is about a 47 yard. Yeah, they're going to kick the field goal. And it's really an interesting story. You know, their field goal kicker, Banani, who was coming back as a returning starter, injured a vertebrae in his back at a summer job at Bush Gardens on a 35 foot fall. And now Eric Schwartz, a walk on who's nine for 13. He's had two block kicks this season. But another guy that stepped up as a walk-on kicker after Bonani went down with that injury in the summer. Think UConn will ice him here? Well, we've got a couple timeouts remaining. Might not be a bad idea, but I think the weather's taking care of the icing. This one's coming from 46. Schwartz. Ooh. And it's wide to the right. And that's the end of the first half of play. Coach Levitt's team down 13 to 7 in the snow. UConn looking for its third consecutive win. They lead 13 to 7 at the break. Right now, let's join Wendy Nix, Todd McShay, and Robert Smith for the Outback Steakhouse halftime report. Mark, thank you very much. It is just slightly warmer. Welcome back, everyone, to Rentschler Field in East Hartford, Connecticut. Connecticut leading South Florida as we get started here in the third quarter of play. Connecticut looking for its third consecutive win. And South Florida looking to bounce back after losing last week as we go deep inside Davy Jones locker. Both these two teams with a lot in common on the kickoff return. Jordan Todman. And Todman brings it out to the 31-yard line. Bob, when you look at UConn, they got to Division I. Pardon me, FBS. And they've only been in FBS for a short time. Meanwhile, South Florida has been in the FBS uh, since 2005. Uh, 
Similarities and differences. Well, I think the biggest difference is Connecticut was a one double A program since like 1897. USF starting from scratch. I mean, I'm talking about they didn't have socks. They didn't have <laughs> footballs. They didn't have practice fields. They didn't have anything, which is an unbelievable situation. They're going to just start it from nothing. His pass complete. At the 45 yard line and what about some of the special challenges faced by coaches trying to start up programs right from the beginning coming out of trailers for football. Conferences. Well everybody that starts it. I'm talking about administratively coaches every university that starts follows the Jim Levitt model. You look at Larry Coker at Texas San Antonio Bill Curry certainly Howard Schnellenberger. They all go visit Jim Levitt because he's lived it Mark. On the run, it's Jordan Todman. We saw the trailers that South Florida used for football offices earlier on, and uh, certainly can't be a, you can't be one with a weak heart when you try something. Well, like I this. think one thing all these schools starting. You look at Georgia State, UTSA. You know, you you South Florida is the ninth largest enrollment in the country with 46,000 students. Georgia State and Texas San Antonio are bigger enrollments as well in big cities. So a lot of parallels there, a lot of potential. You look at the high school football in the state of Georgia. You look at the high school football in the state of Texas. You look at Atlanta, you look at San Antonio. A lot of parallels to Tampa and South Florida. But this guy right here has the blueprint. Mark. It's interesting, it kind of underscores how well UConn has done in spite of the fact that this area doesn't have the advantages that some of the yeah. big metro areas you just mentioned exactly. carry exactly. with it. Connecticut doing up it, doing it up here in the Northeast is a different challenge. Third down and two. And that's Todd been close to the first down with a final lunge. Looks like he came up just a little bit short depending on that spot. It'll be fourth down coming up for the Huskies. First half, UConn only 10 rushing attempts for 27 yards. You know, they only had 19 plays in the first half. South Florida dominating time of possession. That's why this crowd's booing a little bit right now. You know, Jim, uh, Randy Edsel was tempted, Mark, just to keep the football a little bit because they haven't had the ball. Well, the punt team comes onto the field. Cullen standing at his own 40 yard line. And we get a flag now. Offense. Five yard penalty. Fourth down. Cullen's had a pretty good year. Senior and captain. Very good performance so far this season, according to the head coach, uh, Randy Edsel. Derek, Derek Chard, the deep snapper, Mark. Good snap. Collins punt at the 10 yard line. Horns called for the fair catch as we take a look at the first half stats brought to you by World of Warcraft. Both yeah. teams keeping it on the ground. Yeah, the big thing that jumps out at you is time of possession. Total yards pretty similar, but as I mentioned, South Florida with twice as many plays in the first half. South Florida with the turnover. The fumble hurt them. Both quarterbacks throwing the ball accurately, Mark, particularly with these conditions the way they are. I misspoke when I said both teams keep them on the ground. Uh, UConn, as you pointed out, having good success in the air. Daniels hands it off to Mike Ford. Picked up about two on the play. South Florida putting the ball in the tailback's hands more tonight. Partly because of the weather, partly because they've been on such a roller coaster with B.J. Daniels. You know, it all has come down to in the past. How he goes is how the team goes. They're spreading it around a little bit more, letting their offensive line be a factor, letting Big Mike Ford be a factor in this game. Second down and eight. Daniels sacked back at the three yard line by Lutris. Scott Lutris with the sack. 
Sets up third and long now. Second sack of the year for Lutris. Yeah, Lutris, the middle linebacker right here, 32, is going to start to drop, but then he makes a decision to go ahead and contain the quarterback, Mark. Watch him right there. Now you're going to see him flash. Really good straight ahead speed right there. Slippery field, I think, kept B.J. Daniels from making any kind of move right there. Randy Edsel says that Lutris might be one of the better linebackers they've got right now. A loss of eight on the play. Third and 16. That was the 29th sack of the year for the Husky defense. Well, that clock running down again. I tell you, Randy Edsel's decision. Timeout occurred before the foul. Timeout, South Florida. Randy Edsel's decision to punt that football could turn out to be an excellent decision right here, field position wise, Mark. Well, you look at Edsel and Coach Levitt, certainly the coaching landscape changing big time in the state of Florida. We'll talk about that on the other side. Under the lights at Rensselaer Field, I'm Mark Jones along with Bob Davey. 1040 to go in the third quarter. Third and long for the Bulls coming up. Tough spot here for the redshirt freshman quarterback, B.J. Daniels. Well, you have to think quarterback draw or quarterback run here, Mark. Rolls out. Slings it downfield and incomplete. Behind his intended receiver, A.J. Love. Well, Bob, we talked and alluded a few moments ago about the coaching landscape changing forever in the state of Florida. Bobby Bowden retiring and after 34 years on campus in Tallahassee really college football losing one of its icons. Yeah and you know a lot of controversy in some ways you know did Florida State really take the easy way out you know either either I guess you fire Bobby Bowden or you let Bobby Bowden stay. But to say you're going to diminish his responsibilities and put the decision back on him, you know, I'm not sure everyone agrees that that's the best way to do it. There is no easy way to do it, but we better really appreciate Joe Paterno because <laughs> Joe Paterno and Bobby Bowden are the last two guys from that era that are just so refreshing to be around and listen to. And one of the intriguing scenarios out there, it's being reported that the Gator Bowl officials are trying to effort a matchup between West Virginia and Florida State. West Virginia is where a lot of people forget Bobby Bowden started his coaching career. Exactly. You know, in West Virginia winning today over Rutgers, you know, they won their last two football games against Pittsburgh and a good Rutgers team. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see. But, uh, you know, you knew it wouldn't be totally comfortable at the end because Florida State has not been real successful. But to me, you either make the decision, you fire him, or you let him come back and coach. But to say, okay, Bobby, we're gonna let you come back if you really, really, really want to, but we're gonna take away some of your responsibility. I'm not sure that's really the right way to go. Yeah, good point. Jordan Todman gaining about a yard on the play. And Florida State will play in a bowl game. And for a while there, it looked as though they might not make it and have that long streak come to an end. Well, this Second and nine coming up. The South Florida defense, you know, some concerns about how they'd line up and stop the run tonight against a power running team like Connecticut. They've really taken the run away. Play fake by Fraser. Todman. And chopped down at the 42 yard line. The rush was coming hard that time by the Bulls up front. And really a great job, as you mentioned. Zach Frazier getting a lot of pressure. Goes to the little check down to Jordan Todman. Watch, he's going to get really good pressure here by the defensive end. That's an excellent job right there of just taking that check down, knowing where he was on the field. Got the first down, ball at about the 40-yard line. Little receiver screen, easily got rocked. Big hit there on the corner by number 12, Leslie.
There's the guys that are cold. Those guys standing over there, they can't get enough of those hand warmers now. They probably got those little chemical things in there you're rubbing the palms of your hands. Probably kind of like you do in that jacket you're wearing right now. Oh, you saw them, huh? <laughs> like they're hitting. Todman on the carry. Yeah, you know, there's Todman, a guy that grew up in North Dartmouth, Massachusetts. It's not exactly a party for him either. It's cold for him, too, now. But starting to get a little bit of a running game going right here. Interesting call, Mark, if this is four down territory, if they run this football twice right here, Connecticut. This is Dixon, the senior. Got a nice crease and a first down at the 21 yard line. Andre Dixon picked up 16 on that scamper. Yeah, he's going to get an excellent block by Big Hicks, 79. They double teamed the three technique right there, Keith McCaskill. Dixon, a little more of a power back, Mark. This may suit him kind of like it does Mike Ford from South Florida, these playing conditions. First and 10, the pass incomplete. Intended for easily back to Dixon. You know, you talk about great stories. Coach Edsel, very proud of his progress. You go back to some of the close calls that he's had. You know, he was suspended earlier in his career, was in poor condition at one point, unmotivated as a junior, had all of nine carries last year. And then December of last year, he was arrested for drunken driving, thought he was done, went into the coach's office, and the coach said, No more chances. This is really your last one. And boy, Things have really turned around for Andre Dixon. He's been extremely productive as he closes in on a thousand yards rushing. This is Todman, the other half of that running combination. And Todman picks up 14. First down, Huskies. Watch the big offensive tackle, the other one now. Matt Ryan, 71. He's going to pull around. Really can't find anyone to block right here until he gets downfield. Nice little counter play right there. Good move by Jordan Todman in the open field. Had 162 against Cincinnati, 130 against Notre Dame. To the air, Fraser, and he throws that one away. You know, you look at the Big East now. Noel Devine, Dion Lewis from Pittsburgh. I mean, he is outstanding. He carried the ball almost four oh. times today. Mark, I think he carried it 30 some 29 in the first half. I think you put Jordan Todman into that conversation a little bit as a sophomore. It's been a heck of a year for the Big East yeah. now. Yeah. I mean, the Big East has emerged now across the country with some of these late season games. We have Dixon on the carry. Tough sledding down there in the shadows of the goal line. A pickup of three on the play, and yeah, it was just a couple of years ago. There were some people wondering whether the Big East Conference should maintain its automatic qualifier status, but boy, you talk about the success of the conference this year. Cincinnati, West Virginia, Pittsburgh, all nationally ranked. Well, the nationally televised games, when you have Pittsburgh and, Cincinnati and Connecticut beating Notre Dame on national TV, you had the West Virginia Pitt game last Friday night. You have the Cincinnati pit game today. I mean, they've been showcased now. They've had a lot of eyes on those games. Third and goal for the Huskies. Caught. Touchdown. Isaiah Moore. The ball just breaking the plane for the score. Yeah, John Legist. Number 12, Mark, just playing too far off down here in the red zone. That's just a simple throw and catch right there. Is this going to be reviewed? Uh, it's close. That knee was down as he extended the football, but Legis 12 just playing too far off. I mean, that's an easy throw and catch. UConn had a problem with the extra point a couple of touchdowns ago. This one. Straight through and good. And go back to Randy Edsel's decision to punt the football on the prior series. They get the football back in good field position. Those little coaching decisions go unnoticed. But that led to that touchdown.
ESPN's College Football Primetime. Brought to you by Nissan, proud partner of the Heisman Trophy. Well, it almost looks like you got to take a ticket to get a spot up front there by the heater on the sidelines. But the Connecticut offense heating up right now, leading 20 to 7 with 618 to go in the third quarter. One thing I know, whichever team's ahead, in this case UConn right now, it's about 15 degrees warmer on their sidelines than the team that's behind. The winning team always feels warm. Write that down. All right. You got that. <laughs> winning makes everything we'll write that better. Down. It makes everything better. Winning fans, look, she's winning, she's happy, she feels good. Now, if we can find a South Florida fan, I promise you, they're not feeling that good. Here we go on the kickoff return. This is Ontavia Bogan. And Bogan's still on his feet. Bogan with a good kickoff return out to midfield. Right at the 50 yard line, and he's a little shaken up. Bogan's down. Yeah, big hit by Jerome Williams, number 55 from Connecticut on that kickoff, Mark. It was a nice return, 37 yards, and let's take a look at the end of this play. See where he was shaking it right Ooh, there. Boy, he took a shot to the helmet right there. It almost looked like a helmet to helmet blow. You know, Bogan's a guy that the South Florida coaches, Bob, they were telling us they're looking to find different ways to make him a bigger part of the offense. And he's had a tough year, Mark, because of the young quarterback. You know, when, when you had a quarterback like Grothy, he really took advantage of those slot receivers. Where B.J. Daniels, a little more of a running quarterback, throw the ball down the field. You know, a little more of a timing kind of thing, getting it to those inside slots on those little option routes. And Bob, while we have a little break here, folks, remember, join Reese Davis, Mark May, Lou Holtz, and Jesse Palmer Sunday night for the Bowl Selection Special. The matchups of all 34 Bowl games will be announced and dissected by our analysts. The Bowl Selection Special powered by Chevy Silverado on ESPN Sunday at 8 o'clock Eastern. For more information, log on to ESPN.com. Boy, you see what those kickoff returns do, don't you? Marty Gilliard today. Hugh running those kickoffs back for Cincinnati and USF now. You see Bogans on the sidelines now. Obviously, what he's signaling, he got knocked in the head right there. There's your quarterback. Daniels right? keeps it himself, makes a nice move to elude one tackler and brought down at about the 47 yard line by Robert McLean. He picked up four on the play. Talked about his dynamic athletic skills, uh, BJ Daniels. Played on the basketball team at South Florida as well. And uh, Bob, you mentioned, yeah, that Memphis was also interested in him as a two sport athlete, too. 445 total yards against Louisville. 341 against Florida State. He had a 77 and a 73 yard touchdown against the Seminoles. And off to Ford. And Ford brought down nicely by Lutris. Picked up one on the play. Remember this Connecticut defense playing without Greg Lloyd, who injured his knee and is out for the season. And that's a famous name. Okay. When you talk about linebackers now, his daddy, former NFL linebacker. That's why Lutris has moved to Mike linebacker, the inside linebacker position. Normally plays Sam or the outside linebacker position. Third and five coming up. Daniels rolls out. Has a man wide open. Caught. Hester with a first down for the Bulls. Yeah, we talk about other famous names. Jesse Hester, the former Florida statewide receiver from Bell Glade, Florida, runs the corner route right here. Beats Robert McClain. 
But how about the throw by B.J. Daniels on the run, Mark? Look at a wide-open Jesse Hester. He hung that ball up, threw it perfectly right there. All the way down to the 10-yard line. That is a well-thrown football. Daniels apparently dealing pretty well with the snow here. First and goal after the 36-yard gain. Daniels keeps it himself. Looking for a block on the edge and lunging forward to about the two-yard line. McLean finally making the stop. Well, he made a nice move out there to get into space, picked up eight. He did, and I'll tell you what, Robert McLean out in the open field, that was a heck of a job now. I mean, you talk about being out on an island with all that grass outside you. He had a blocker on him, and he comes off and makes the play on B.J. Daniels. That was a heck of an effort out there in the open field. Robert sets up a second and goal for the Bulls. Ford the lone back beside Daniels. See B.J. Daniels trying to get that footwork, dig that foot in the ground out here in that slippery, slippery footing. Broke a tackle and scored. Touchdown Bulls. For B.J. Daniels, his seventh rushing touchdown of the season and of his career. Yeah, you said it, Mark. He ran through the tackle of Jerome Jr., the freshman free safety up on the line of scrimmage. And that was a key drive sparked by that excellent kickoff return by Bogans and the third down completion to Jesse Hester. Schwartz's extra point is good, and the Bulls backed within six points. Those USF fans in the stadium, they're feeling better. It's a lot warmer right now, Mark Jones. <laughs> B.J. Daniels getting it into the end zone. Things getting a little bit more interesting. Back after this. Robert Flores coming to you from the ESPN studios. A triple header of games on the ESPN family of networks. ABC bringing you a close game. Big 12 championship. Texas up on Nebraska by one. And Georgia Tech leading Clemson 23-20 third quarter in the ACC title game. Meantime, Mark Jones, Bob Davey up the road in Hartford. All right, Robert. Six-point game after that touchdown run by B.J. Daniels a few moments ago. Bulls fans warming up a little bit after that score. Keep an eye on UConn's kickoff return unit, though. They've run back three for touchdowns. A short kick. Fielded by Davis. And returned out to the 37-yard line. First down and 10 for the Huskies, looking for their third consecutive win. UConn 6 and 5 overall coming into this game. And they are bowl eligible for the third consecutive year. You always talk about on these situations, Mark, with that ball in the air, don't ever catch it going backwards. But Anthony Davis right there knew Randy Edsel would be waiting for him. Turned it into a pretty good return. But you always let the guy coming forward catch that football with momentum. You don't want to be backpedaling and catching it. Does the coach still give him the evil eye when he gets to the side? Not line? as evil because it ended up <laughs> to a positive return. First down and 10. Todman broke a tackle and gained about six on the play. Yeah, good run right there by Jordan Todman breaking that thing to the outside. Went to a very small high school. Averaging right at about 100 yards a game. That was a good cut right there. Did a great job, as we mentioned, replacing Donald Brown, who led the country in rushing a season ago. Andre Brown in the game now for Todman. Frazier completes it. And Michael Smith broke a tackle for the first down at the 48-yard line. He picked up eight, and Frazier is now 12 of 16 on the night. Trip to its third consecutive bowl game. And so will Jim Levitt's group, making yeah. their fifth consecutive bowl appearance. You know, if UConn wins this game, Mark, they finish seven and five. If they lose, they finish six and six. 
And there is a huge difference now between six and six and seven and five. Dixon on the carry. Well, on ESPN's Monday Night Football, Ray Lewis in Baltimore take on the Green Bay Packers and Aaron Rodgers. Both teams need to win to stay in contention for a wild card berth. 8:30 Eastern Time. It all starts at seven with Monday Night Countdown served by Applebee's. And uh, guess what, Bob? They're expecting, I'm told, snow in Green Bay. Huh? <laughs> you know, is that a about, scoop? <laughs> and how about Aaron Rodgers? Though I mean, he's had a great year. He's had really a good year, but because of Brett Favre. And the kind of year Brett Favre's in, which is unbelievable, he's still fighting that deal and probably will be forever now. Certainly is, and Frazier throws it out of bounds. Is Brett Favre your MVP right now in the oh, NFL? Oh, he has to be. Huh. He has to be. I mean, he has had an unbelievable season. He's got the sentimental vote, too, doesn't Boy. he? Boy. Drew Brees has had a great season as well for the New Orleans Saints, still undefeated. Yeah, but Brett Favre's 40 years old. He is 40 years old, coming off some repairs to his arm. It's an unbelievable story. Now, watching Drew Brees the other night against the <laughs> New England Patriots. Pretty good. You got a good point there. 127 to go in the third quarter. Zach Frazier throws underneath, complete to Easley, who has a touchdown catch already tonight. His forward progress is going to be marked at about the 39 for a five yard gain. And we. Chronicle the progress of Marcus Easley throughout the course of his career. The former walk on finally awarded a scholarship at the beginning of this season, and what an impact he has made. Yeah, that was a good tackle by Sam Barrington, the freshman linebacker. You know, this is a tough decision right here for Randy Edsel. I mean, the field position game is so important. But again, you lined up with Dixon, the power back in the game, and that big offensive lineman. This is the way they like to run it. Dixon gets the call and gets the first down at the 37 yard line. A three yard gain in a first play and let's take a look at how UConn is managing the game brought to you by Edward Jones. Bob are you surprised that they've thrown it yeah. as well as they yeah. have tonight. Yeah you talk about managing the game that right there. That 13 for 18 for 158 yards, two TDs. Zach Frazier is managing the game now. Todman back in the ball game at running back. Todman gets the handoff. Goes over the right side of that offensive line, running over the top of Big Mike Hicks and Zach Hurd, and a seven yard gain by Jordan Todman. Yeah, Mike Ryan with an excellent block. One of those pancake blocks now. And that's the end of the first third quarter play. 15 minutes to go here in East Hartford, Connecticut. Back with more after this. Let's take a look at our game track brought to you by Timberland. Andre Dixon with a 12 yard touchdown run and then boy Mike Ford with a powerful run into the end zone to counter for the South Florida Bulls. Well, Zach Frazier's had a hot hand tonight, too, despite the inclement weather. And Todman with, pardon me, Marcus Easley has had a career-high catch in the ball. B.J. Daniels, good rusher, good passer. Six-point ball game as we enter the fourth quarter play. I'm Mark Jones along with Bob Davey here at Wrenchler Field in East Hartford, Connecticut. The Huskies with the football. Andre Dixon with a gaping hole up the middle all the way down to the 17. Yeah, good block by the fullback Anthony Sherman and Mike Hicks, the offensive tackle. That's against Mo Petrus, the center. That's going to draw the ire of the head coach, Mo. Randy Edsel. Yeah, Mo is the smallest of the Connecticut offensive linemen. Watch the block by the fullback right there. Boom. And this flag is going to come in late. See Petrus right there, 57. Just finished that play late, Mark. Got the personal foul penalty. 
Moves the ball back to the 32 yard line. When you say the smallest of the group, not really small, of course. <laughs> That's Todman now. And Todman picks up about three. Todman and Dixon doing a nice job in the backfield for the Huskies. You know, we talked about Connecticut. If they win seven and five as opposed to six and six being a big difference. South Florida sitting there at three and three in the Big East right now, Mark. So they're playing for a winning record in the Big East. So both these teams going to a bowl game, but this game's important now. Todman takes the handoff. He is met immediately right at the line of scrimmage by George Selvey. That might be Selvey's first stop of the night. The All-American getting in the action right there, the 6'4 senior. Yes, yeah, Selvey's going to beat Mike Ryan, the big offensive tackle right here. Comes around the horn. That shows the kind of quickness, the kind of pass rush ability he has. draws a lot of attention now this guy would love to just be singled in a passing situation where you don't have a tight end or a back chipping off on him this isn't his type of party tonight pass incomplete at the 17 yard line intended for Marcus Easley and it's fourth down coming up yeah now you go back to that penalty by Mo Petrus number 57 because this makes this a very tough field goal attempt right here, Mark. Yeah, David Taggart coming in, and uh, this one's going to come from about 46 yards out. And he was better last year. You got to watch slipping on the field. You know, that's where it's always a delicate thing with kickers off of that plant foot. High snap, but they get it down, and it's blocked. Blocked, and no good. Didn't get beyond the line of scrimmage, so South Florida comes up with a big play on special teams here. That's the second field goal that Tegger has blocked this season. And anytime you kick from a further distance, you go back to that penalty by Mo Petrus. Let's take a look. The snap's a little bit high. Yeah, they just came right up the middle. Jason Pierre Paul. Number 90, I think, Mark, just came right up the middle and swatted that thing. There he is. And an opportunity for the Bulls. First and 10, Ford in the backfield, gets the handoff. And Ford out near the 40, picked up about five on the play. It's amazing how certain style guys play different in different conditions. You know, Mike Ford, kind of a patient runner his feet always up underneath him he doesn't get off balance and he's strong you know so he doesn't panic but all the running backs in rushing yards a season ago despite fighting some ankle problems he's run 15 times for 56 yards tonight on second down it's Ford again out near the 40 yard line got about one and interesting with Mike Ford you talk about his ankle struggles last year, nothing compared to the fact that a couple of years ago he lost his father, now the late Robert Ford, who he was extremely close to and has dedicated the rest of his football career to his late father. His father was a maintenance worker at South Florida's Sarasota campus. And loved by all the students he came into contact with. Third down and four coming up for the Bulls. Complete. And a first down at the 45. Andrew Ketchell lunging forward to get the first down. He picked up five. Well, folks, join Reese Davis, Mark May, Lou Holtz, and Jesse Palmer Sunday night for the Bowl Selection Special. All the matchups of the 34 Bowl games will be announced and dissected by our analysts. The Bowl Selection Special powered by Chevy Silverado on ESPN Sunday at 8 Eastern. For more information, log on to ESPN.com. First and ten for USF. Ford again. And Ford right at midfield picking up five. 
Now, Bob, he really does look comfortable in this type of rhythm, in this type of game. I'll tell you who else is comfortable. B.J. Daniels. You, know, you talk about a freshman quarterback from Tallahassee, Florida. Coming up here under these conditions, Mark. I'm impressed. I'm impressed with this young guy. He has been pretty consistent tonight. And he's not doing it with just all the quarterback runs. You know, he's managing the game. He's throwing the ball. He's handing it off. Out of the shotgun. Daniels keeps it himself. Down to the 48-yard line. Picked up two where Lutris makes the stop. Well, here's what's happening now under the lights at Rentschler Field. A look at the total yard situation. Pretty much even the slight edge going to the Huskies. And coming up ahead, we're going to talk some potential bowl scenarios and some of the matchups. And something that's very topical here is the stepping stone syndrome and coaches perhaps staying, perhaps leaving. Randy Edsel in the news. Third down and three. Daniels trying to get to the edge. Broke a tackle and got the first down at the 42-yard line. I tell you, that is a strong young man. He runs through the tackle of Aaron Bagsby, number 27, out there in the open field. This is a powerful guy in the lower body, B.J. Danders, Mark. Watch this effort. That's a good, tough run right there. Another third down conversion. Another key third down. From the 41. Daniels. Caught. And it's ruled complete at the 31. Let's go back to Robert Flores in the studio. All right, Mark. Josh Nesbitt doesn't throw it a whole lot, but when he does, he gets a lot of bang for his buck. Georgia Tech quarterback Nesbitt finding Demarius Thomas. 70-yard touchdown. And Georgia Tech is now up 30 to 20 in the ACC title game. They've added a field goal to make it 33-20 on ESPN. Mark. All right, Robert. Is it just me, Bob, or does every time Demarius Thomas makes a catch, it's like for at least 50 yards? And we know, saw them earlier this year. Yeah, Mark, and they're going to review this catch on the sidelines. I thought he was out of bounds. But Georgia Tech. A lot of people said, okay, Clemson has the advantage defensively because they played the triple option. They played Georgia Tech early in the season. But what they don't realize, Paul Johnson now knows how you played them. So that offense just so difficult. Here's the review again. Looks like that right well, leg touched down yeah, before he did. was hit. It did. That was Carlton Mitchell on the reception. Right there, right there, the right leg. It. Yeah, and it, it, did he have possession? You know, the football was juggling just a little bit right there. The foot's down. Does he have possession? Does that little juggle? I'll tell you, the official was right there and had a great look at it, Bob. Yeah, Robert McClain comes in, gives him a good shot in the back, Mark. The foot's in. I don't think he had possession, though. And you could see the Lions judge totally focused on the foot. I'm not sure he could see if he had possession. There was a slight bobble right there. Well, if that pass stands, Carlton Mitchell will have just set a USF record for career receiving yards. These officials do a remarkable yeah. job, though, don't they? This has been a season, Bob Davey, I mean, where instant replays. Even re instant replays are coming under scrutiny. We've gone full, full circle on this. The length of that last review, a minute 27. And it's a first and 10 from the 31 now for the Bulls. 9.18 to go. And Coach Jim Levitt telling us before that it's important that they finish with a record above 500 in the Big East. A win tonight, they'd improve to 4-3 and three in conference play. Yeah, that backup quarterback up here in the game again, Mark. Daniels hands it off to Ford. 
Ford with nowhere to go, but spun out of a couple of tacklers' arms and makes it down to the 27. And I'm impressed. I'm impressed with South Florida. After losing that game, and Mark, you live down in South Florida. You know the magnitude of them getting Miami at home last week. They lay an egg. They come up here in this kind of weather. A lot of teams would have folded it now. I'm telling you, a lot of teams would have folded it tonight. They're getting stronger as the game's going on. I really like the character of this team coming up here tonight and playing as hard as they're playing. It would have been easy to let go of the rope. They haven't done that. Landy in motion. Daniels keeps it himself. Has an alley. B.J. Daniels taking <laughs> off to a touchdown. A raging bull. B.J. Daniels scores. Yeah, and watch Mike Cox, the defensive end, 56 mark. He's just going to crash down inside. B.J. Daniels keeps it. And when he headed north and south, now there's Cox. Watch him going upfield right now. Almost looks too easy right there. But I'll tell you what, he's got a burst now. That Florida speed making its presence in the frigid cold here in a Connecticut night. With 8.05 to go, the Bulls with an opportunity to go ahead now with the extra point. And the University of South Florida taking a lead with 8.05 yeah. to go. Colder. It's colder for those <laughs> Connecticut fans. Temperature dropped. The second touchdown of the night for B.J. Daniels. Get off me, he says. <laughs> You think B.J. Daniels is excited? Type of play that really brings a team together. Mark, he's getting stronger as this game goes on. Kind of like the South Florida football team, getting stronger. Man. That must be a Husky <laughs> fan. <laughs> that looks like a statue right you, now. You got to give these fans credit, though. <laughs> I mean, seriously, Mark. Because they could be home listening to Mark Jones doing this play-by-play, <laughs> -play, right? <laughs> Uh, Sitting here sticking it out tonight. I mean, they could have that remote going, checking that Nebraska-Texas game back and forth. Surfing the ESPN family and networks, huh? I mean, look, they could be watching that triple option, Georgia Tech, Clemson. They could be doing a lot of things. Hey, this is real football. I mean, that's football TV. right there. This is football weather. Look at this. <laughs> that was all blue. <laughs> His face is facing the wind. That's the wind blowing in the oh, snow. Oh, that's not painted there. white? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's snow on the other half. Okay. Fumble on the kickoff, and Todman jumps on it at the 27-yard line. There's a flag down on the play. Mentioned the fact that Connecticut has run three back for touchdowns this year. Offside, three on the kicking team. Five-yard penalty in the end of the run. First down. One more look at that last touchdown run by Daniels. What was the key on it? Well, Mark, first of all, Connecticut's going to pinch the defensive end down inside. Correction. They're the trying to get the defensive tackle around on a stunt. But what happens, B.J. Daniels reads the defensive end, close him. The defensive tackle can't get around, and it's a foot race now. But that's the read option at its finest right there. We'll talk about the fact that B.J. Daniels gained some valuable experience, Bob, when Jim Levitt lost Matt Grothy, his starting quarterback, during summer ball. And Daniels had an opportunity to take a lot of snaps for about a week with the number ones. So they're going to kick this off again from the 25-yard line. You mentioned UConn. Three kickoff returns for touchdowns. Mike Long back there, number seven, had an 80-yarder against Syracuse. Jordan Todman had won 96 against Notre Dame and Bobby Fry 100 against Rutgers. Comes down at the 24 to Todman. Let's see what he does with it. Returns at 12 yards out to the 42. Good starting field position here on this drive with 7.55 to go. You can check out the graphics and see the timeout situations at the bottom of your screen. UConn 
with its full complement of three remaining South Florida with two. And UConn again, Mark, five losses by 15 points. And the reason the Notre Dame game was so big, they had lost to West Virginia, Rutgers, and Cincinnati three straight tough losses. They're headed for another close finish here tonight. Certainly shaping up that way. Play fake. Frazier oh. downfield. Open on the post and incomplete. Intended for Kashif Moore. It almost looked like he stopped running for a while. Yeah, Mark, the corner slipped and fell. And Kashif Moore was wide open down the field. I think it was 22 George Baker. Yeah, he's coming out of the game right now for South Florida. He slipped and fell, and Kashif Moore was wide open down the field. Yeah, Mark, you're right. He kind of jostled those feet and slowed yeah. down. George Baker, a freshman out of Miami. Frazier pulls the trigger again. This one complete to easily. Pushed out of bounds at about the 48-yard line. Pickup of seven. Well, we talked about the shortcomings late in the game of Randy Edsel's team. They've lost five games by a total of 15 points. Look at that. That's enough to break a team's spirit, but they certainly have bounced back, especially starting with that game against Notre Dame, Bob. And there were two late penalties against UConn in yeah. that game in regulation yeah. that were questionable penalties at best. Two holding penalties. So they had to win it the hard way now. Yeah. <laughs> This is Todman on the counter. And Todman gets the first down at the 45 yard line. A pickup of seven. And that little counter with the offensive tackle pulling Mark on a misdirection play, that has been Connecticut's best run tonight. We have an injured player down in the field. That's number 97, Terrell McLean, who was dealing with a shoulder injury coming into this game tonight. McLean got the start for Keith McCaskill. Well, a big part of the UConn attack coming into this game this evening. Jordan Todman and Andre Dixon, and look at their numbers tonight. Dixon needed about 85 yards or so to reach that 1,000-yard mark. Doesn't look like he's going to get there tonight. Yeah. Well, Todman averages about 98 a game. And Andre Dixon about 83 a game. So they're under their average tonight, but they haven't had the football a lot. You know, UConn has not been able to just pound South Florida like some people thought they might. Oh, Frazier got rid of it in time. And incomplete intended for Brad Cunyon. Great pressure by Jason Pierre Paul, the junior college defensive end, Mark. And this guy's going to be a player now. It's interesting, Bob. Uh, after that game against University of Miami, I ran into Ja'Cory Harris in South Florida a couple of days ago. He told me that as good as George Selby is at the other end, he thought that Jason Pierre-Paul actually played a better game against them last week. Andre Dixon in the backfield. Over the middle and a rifle, a dart complete at the 31 to the tight end, Ryan Griffin for the first down. A pickup of 15 on the play. Really a good job by Zach Frazier, Mark, of stepping up in the pocket. You know, he had some pass rush. There's two defensive ends up the field. He stepped up and delivered that football to the tight end. Well, Zach Frazier has been on his game tonight. Todman. Broke the tackle and picks up another first down at the 19-yard line. A 14-yard gain for the sophomore. We talk about the speed of these defensive ends. I want you to right, watch the right defensive end, Jason Pierre-Paul Marker. That may be Selby. But watch him run up the field right now. He's going to run up the field, but the problem is a running play. You see that crease in there as Mo Petrus, the center, pulls around. Yeah, that was George Selvey. One of the two playmakers. Fraser incomplete in the end zone, intended for Griffin, who couldn't squeeze it. 
Yeah, that time Selby with excellent pass protection. Excellent pass rush by Selby. Watch Selby right here, Mark, but the tight end up the seam. Ball thrown behind him, right in the back shoulder. Number five, Nate Allen on coverage. But Ryan Griffin was open. Certainly was. There's a look at number 95, the All-American George Selvey. Backs lining up out of the eye. Todman dotting that eye. It's his turn. And Todman plowing forward down to the 13-yard line. Bob, you, you weren't impressed by my name drop when I said I ran into Jacoby Harris? <laughs> well, I'm trying to get over that, you know, talking about Pierre Paul and, and Selvey. Well, you told me the whole story. <laughs> you were down at South Beach. And you mentioned you were going to call Randy Shannon and say, hey, this is a Tuesday yeah. and you guys aren't in class. Yeah. But Ja'Cory was ready for that. Yeah, he was. He said they weren't in school. Yeah. Third and seven. Ninth play of the drive. Frazier complete. Down to the three-yard line. Kashif Moore with the catch and the run. First and goal Huskies. A 10-yard gain. Yeah, just a little option route by Kashif Moore out of the slot. He comes down, sets up the linebacker, then breaks to the outside. Hey, Connecticut throwing the football better than I thought they could throw the football. You know, Zach Frazier now, it's his job, Mark, and he's settled down. And he's playing like people expected him to play coming out of high school. See the graphic. Tenth play of the drive. And Dixon didn't get in. It'll be second down and goal coming up. Picked up two on the play. Dixon had three touchdowns last week in their romp over Syracuse. What if that, what if that hair keeps you warm? <laughs> You would think that'd be worth some degrees of warmth right there, the way that drapes around his neck. I right? use anything to keep warm in this weather. <laughs> that big offensive line right now, Mark. And follow the fullback, Anthony Sherman. That's probably where that football is going. Second and goal. Dixon. Touchdown, Huskies. Connecticut takes the lead. Connecticut sending in their place kicker. Actually, it looks like they're going to go for two here. It's a five point advantage for the Huskies as Dixon comes off the field, his second touchdown tonight. Todman in for Dixon. Two point conversion would make it a seven point game. The handoff and into the end zone. Incomplete. Boy, How Frazier really sold the fake and yeah. easily couldn't catch it. The Boise State and go. You fake the Statue of Liberty and you try to hit easily up the seam. A variation of the Boise State Statue of Liberty. Had him open. And overshot him by just a bit. That's one of those plays, Mark. They've worked on that play for probably a season. And they had it open, it just didn't complete it. That looks like you doing those push-ups. Go all the way down. Yeah. That's half a push-up. I'm touching my nose to the turf. Come on now. Back after this. Well, remember, this is Jimmy V Week. And to donate to the V Foundation for Cancer Research, call 1-800-4-JIMMY-V or log on to www.jimmyv.org. 100% of every donation award goes to cancer research. These two quarterbacks, Zach Frazier now 17 of 26, 195 yards, two touchdowns. B.J. Daniels 10 of 13 for 140. Throwing the football, both quarterbacks. And uh, UConn managing the game very well. Goes right back to their head coach, Randy Edsel. Short kickoff and the Bulls will get control in good field position working with a short field. Wow. Here. 
at the 44 yard line. Mark, you get so cautious on these kickoffs. He just drilled it right into Raquan Williams, the linebacker, 57. He just he just drilled a low liner. Watch. <laughs> Sets up really good field position again for South Florida. I'll tell you, when you don't have confidence in your kickoff yeah. coverage, it opens a whole can of worms now. First down and 10 for the University of South Florida, the 44. And they give us the big tailback, Mike Ford, and Bob, he picks up about three. A lot of speculation this week about coaching openings, vacings with some hirings and firings imminent. Randy Edsel's name front and center, especially with respect to the Notre Dame job, but Randy Edsel this week refusing to answer questions or even acknowledge questions about job availabilities which pertain to him. Well, I think there's even more speculation about Kansas. You know, Lou Perkins, the AD, was the AD here at Connecticut, hired Randy Edsel. And Lou Perkins is a football man, one of the best athletic directors in the country. So you can see that tie there. Second down and six. Daniel stays on his feet. Got a nice block on the edge, and B.J. Daniels still in bounds. And actually, they're going to say he stepped out of bounds at the 36-yard line. Good block on the edge by wide receiver Carlton Mitchell. Yeah, and they wanted holding over on that Connecticut side, Mark. He got two good blocks by the two inside receivers, but then watch Carlton Mitchell clear on the outside, number two. Those are two good blocks. If we let it roll, the question's going to come clear on the outside right there that's the hole <laughs> i don't know let it play from the 36 first down and 10. ford again found a crease over the right side running over sims and hein he picked up four lawrence wilson making the stop on the play remember this all set up by that kickoff, which South Florida picked up at its own 45. UConn with three timeouts remaining. You see that on the graphic at the bottom of your screen. University of South Florida with two timeouts remaining. South Florida looking for its eighth win of the season against four defeats. You have to love the enthusiasm B.J. Daniels brings to this yeah. team. I mean, he brings a certain kind of swagger and confidence now. And this South Florida team's feeling it, Mark. He's showing a lot of poise, keeps it himself. And makes something out of seemingly nothing to pick up about five on the play. Well, on ESPN's Monday Night Football, Ray Lewis and the Ravens taking on Aaron Rodgers and the Packers, both teams needing a win to stay in contention for a wild card berth. 8.30 Eastern, it all starts at 7 Eastern with Monday Night Countdown served by Applebee's. See Eric Schwartz there at the bottom of your screen warming up the place kicker yeah. if he's needed. I don't think he's going to see him because that's a <laughs> <laughs> unless he has a five point field goal. I don't think you're going to see Schwartz. My bad. It's going to be four down territory the whole way here. That's why they'll probably run the football right here. Oh. Getting ahead of myself a little bit. No, and uh, whistle. Flag on the play. That's big. Yeah. That was big to get that time wow. out right there. South Florida with one timeout remaining, 109 to work with. UConn's been here several times. ESPN's College Football Primetime, brought to you by Ally Bank, a bank designed around the idea of doing right by you. Find out how at AllyBank.com. 109 to go here at Rentschler Field in East Hartford, Connecticut. The Huskies with a five-point lead. They've lost five games this year by a total of 15 points. They've been in these types of situations many times this year. On this opportunity, trying to end up on the positive end of it. Third and one coming up for South Florida with the ball. Daniels incomplete intended for Carlton Mitchell yeah, that was really interesting call right there throwing that football I look for him to come back and run the football right here Mark 
on fourth and about one and a half. This could be the ball game right here for the Bulls. Yeah, you didn't. <laughs> And maybe I'm conservative, but I'd have liked to have run that ball on third down and then run it on fourth it's just to get a new set of downs. Mike Ford has done a good ball job of running it today. You have to think it's going to be B.J. Daniels on some kind of read option right here. Connecticut up there showing blitz, trying to outnumber at the line of scrimmage, though. Fourth and one. Here they come. Daniels using his arm. Complete oh, oh, oh. on the underthrown ball to Carlton Mitchell, who hung on this time. Yeah, Mark, how many times the underthrown fake? Bleedy Ray Wilson, Connecticut, his feet slipped out from underneath him, and a receiver came back to the ball. How about the call, though? <laughs> on third and one, you throw it. On fourth and one, you throw the fade. Watch right here. See the defensive back slip, number five, Ray Wilson. And Carlton Mitchell comes back and makes the play, Mark. Great adjustment on it, wasn't it? How about the call? Fourth and one, you throw the fade. Second and goal coming up for the University of South Florida. They spread the field out in empty formation, five receivers. Daniels into the end zone. <sighs> Incomplete. Jesse Hester couldn't squeeze it. And it's third and goal coming up. Boy, that appeared to be right in his hand. He did, Mark. He was open in the back of the end zone. Let's just take a look at it. We see him there. That's about the third or fourth touch on that football. Third and goal for Jim Levitt's team. Connecticut looks like they're blitzing right now, Mark, to take away that quarterback draw or quarterback run by B.J. Daniels. It's straight man-to-man -man coverage. Here they come. And he tries to run it. Using his legs. Daniels. Oh. Touchdown, Bulls. Unbelievable effort. He runs by the angle of the first tackler and then runs over the second tackler. Connecticut comes with the six-man blitz to not give him any running lanes. He runs over Scott Lotris at the goal line. His third rushing touchdown of the night, a career high, and the redshirt freshman gives them the lead by one. They're going to go for the two-point conversion. Yeah, Mark. D.J. Daniels used a burst of acceleration, Bob, to make that play. No question, Mark. And I hope that shows up on the replay. He had another gear. Watch him run out of the angle. Now, keep in mind, they're bringing six trying to keep him from doing this. There's the angle right there. He runs away from right there and then runs him over on the goal line, McClain. He left two tacklers yeah. in his wake. Aaron Bagsby misjudged the speed, and then McLean got run over. And I tell you, you've got a young quarterback right there that has something special, Mark, because he, he turned it on now. There was another gear he hit. Out of Tallahassee, Florida, made his debut at Florida State, won that game. Been a tough act to follow ever since, but a great job tonight. They're going to go for two here. You have to think this is going to be B.J. Daniels on the sprint out to the top of the field. No question it's going to be B.J. Daniels on the sprint out and out of the top of the field. We'll take it on that left hash. Into the end zone and incomplete. So the margin remains one. It was intended for Carlton Mitchell. Randy Edsel's team again. I mentioned they've lost five games this year by a total of 15 points and how much energy how much juice does randy edsel and this connecticut football team have left in the tank mark i mean this is a season like no other we talked about the tragic death of a teammate we talked about the close losses so much emotion so much energy out of this connecticut football team do they have one ounce of juice left you look at the key plays now on that last drive 
It's fourth and one, Mark. Yeah. Guerrero is all set up by that short kickoff, exactly. too. Exactly. And this touchdown run right here. That's a great run. Yeah. Maybe the defining moment in his young career so far. I'll tell you, they're off that bench now, South Florida. <laughs> They've been huddled over there by that heater. They're all up there close to the sidelines. And this is interesting. You know, South Florida has struggled a little bit kickoff coverage-wise. Well, Connecticut has three kickoff returns for touchdowns, and they're going to kick it deep. And three timeouts, Mark. Todman. And Todman out to the 43-yard line with 39 seconds to go and a full complement of timeouts. But, boy, what a day it's been for the Big East. What a day for the conference. You look at the finish in the Pitt-Cincinnati game, and now this one with 38 seconds to go, Bob, coming down to perhaps a last gasp effort field goal there yeah. by Tegger. You know, the Big East has taken total advantage now of these nationally televised games late in the year, and they've all been great finishes. We're set up with, for a great finish here right now with three timeouts left for Connecticut. Fraser throws behind his intended receiver, Marcus Easley, who's had a career day incomplete. 34 seconds to go. This is time right now if you're George Selby and you're Jason Pierre-Paul, this is what you do. I mean, it's passing situation. Let it rip right now. These two guys should dominate this thing, Mark. They've got some great matchups right here. All they've got to do is get into field goal range for Tegan. Second and ten. Frazier completes it to his tight end. That's Ryan Griffin. Picks up the first down at about the 45. And you know, Mark, the snow has stopped. It doesn't look as windy. Did that clock continue to run right there? It looks like they're going to. They're going to have to reset it. Yeah, and you know, that's reviewable as well. I mean, they can go back. They'll get that clock time set. Out. Connecticut, the first timeout. Well, UConn has two timeouts remaining. Seconds on the clock. Thank you. They're going to reset the clock to 27. And David Tegert just hoping for an opportunity for a last gasp effort field goal. His career long is 46 yards. And Mark, he's had a tough year. You know, he missed two against West Virginia, 27 and 44. He missed a 37-yard chip shot against Notre Dame at the end of that game. He actually was better last year. You know, he's been a little inconsistent this season. But what a way if you get an opportunity for Tegger to finish it, right? Now, you talk about his season last year, Bob. Uh, 13 of 15 overall at one point. It made 11 straight. Just hoping for a chance here with 27 seconds to go for the Huskies. Dixon out of the backfield. And Dixon tiptoes out of bounds at about the 40. Picked up about four on the play. It'll be third down. Check that uh, second down and six. And you have to think about Marcus easily. You know South Florida is paying special attention that Marcus Easley lined up over there by Connecticut's bench. This is the key guy, Mark. He's already had a career night. Fraser complete. Kashif Moore and Moore down to the 26-yard line. Connecticut's just going to go ahead and call that timeout. If they would kick it from here, it would be about a 43-yard field goal. Well within David Tegert's range. His career long is 47. Boy, what a night it's been. Yeah, what a night for Zach <laughs> Frazier. You know, 20 for 30, 225 yards. Todman's had a good night. Easley's had a good night. But you know, in the end, it's going to come down to Tegger, the kicker. It's number 38, Dave Tegger, who's had a really inconsistent season, Mark. And you talk about lonely now. At an extra point that was no good earlier tonight. And that plant foot, you see him digging that turf out of that left shoe right there. That is critical, yeah. the footing. Look, nobody going to talk to him. Not only did he not get an extra point tonight, he uh, had a field goal blocked. 
Yeah, they're going to run in the middle of the field. Setting it up down to the 24 yard line. That's Andre Dixon and Randy Edsel calls another timeout with five seconds to go. What a season for Randy Edsel. So many close calls, so many close finishes. In Connecticut, Mark. I mean, it has been an unbelievably exhausting season. And Bob, you know, it's all football on the field, but bigger than that, Randy Itzel has shown himself to be a pillar of compassion dealing with the death of Jasper Howard back in the middle of October. This team has already won in so many different ways. You're right, Mark. And that deep snapper, Derek Shard, 93. Pressures on him. Pressures on the holder, Desi Cullen. But ultimately, the pressures on Dave Taggart right here. For He'll the win. win it or lose it right here. From 42 yards out, for the win, Taggart. And this one will have a happy ending. Knocked it right down the middle, Mark. And Randy Etzel never felt so good getting knocked on his butt as that felt right there. On senior night, the Huskies notched their seventh win of the year. Finally winning one in the game's dying moments. After five agonizing losses by a total of 15 points, they finally get one late. How about Taggart stepping up? And I mean, Mark, you could not have hit it any straighter. Taggart has struggled all year with consistency, but there was no doubt about that one once it left his foot. I tell you what, that's letting it all out right there now. Oh. <laughs> Sometimes when you win, you get knocked down too. Yeah, but it's going to feel good. <laughs> and contrasting emotions on the other side from head coach Jim Levitt of the University of South Florida. And there's the guy that kicked the winning points for the Huskies. David Tegger from 42 yards out. B.J. Daniels certainly did his part with a late touchdown run into the end zone for the Bulls. But UConn wins it, improving to 7-5. and five. It's all about the Bulls next for both these teams. Final score, 29-27 for Connecticut. All's football scoreboard coming up next has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For Bob Davey and our entire gang, I'm Mark Jones. Right now, we're going to send it to Robert Flores, Todd McShay, and Robert Smith in the studio. Guys?